Should we pause our video? Oh, I think we should just go for it. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> And I think we're live. So, okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Coach's Corner. Um, I'm Eli. We have Tristan and Her Highness Rivkin with us tonight. And tonight we are talking about how not to fight your armor, how to uh, choose, fit, adjust, adapt your armor. So it facilitates your improvement in fighting rather than inhibit it. Um, <clears throat> we uh, will be uh, watching for questions uh, live on, on Facebook and doing our best to answer those as we go through. And um, so please ask questions you may have. And with that, um, I thought I would start with, <clears throat> um, let's start with a story. Um, years ago, um, <clears throat> I was at an event and a <clears throat> fellow came up to me, asked me if I would work with him. And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. So we took our positions on guard and his stance was very odd. His stance, he was, he was kind of hunched over with his head down and his, and his hips shifted forward. And I, I said, well, wait, 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 let's, before we do anything, let me adjust your stance. And I adjusted his stance so he was balanced over his feet and centered, and he was looking up. And when I did this, the ocular and the eye slot for his helmet was up here. So he had, he leaned down so he could see that and then had to shift his weight to balance it and it threw everything off. And so I, I talked to him about his armor because we couldn't really do anything about his fighting until we addressed the deficiencies in his armor. Because he was adjusting his fighting to his armor instead of adjusting his armor to the way he needed to fight. <clears throat> and I think that's a relevant illustration of what not to do and, and how to correct it. But that being said, <clears throat> there are three principles that uh, we should keep in mind when we're talking about fitting our, not fighting our armor and tuning it so it works for us. The first principle is safety, functionality, and appearance in that order. So <clears throat> the first thing you want your armor to do is keep you safe from your opponent, but also not injure you as you're using it. I've seen armor, we've all gotten armor bites, but from ill-fitting armor or something that shifts or happens. But the idea is that the armor should keep you safe from others, but also be safe to use. Um, and then appear, uh, functionality. Can you move in it? Can you do what you need to do? There are people who will be safe from uh, injury in their armor, but they can't move in it um, because it, so it's, it's not functional. And then appearance, um, which we all should strive to do, is maintain an appropriate appearance on the field because armor is also garb. Um, that's the first principle. Um, anybody want to chime in with comments on? Oh, uh, that? sure. Um, I think most of us probably have got, had that initial experience where we show up for our, to our first pride of practice and we borrow some armor, we borrow maybe a loaner outfit or somebody else's armor. And it kind of feels like you're, it's just hung on you. It's draped over you. It doesn't fit. It's either too big, too small. Uh, it's taped on. You feel like you've been wrapped in a blanket or something or in a, you know, a rug and you, you can't move. You can't see, you can't breathe. It, it's a dreadful experience. Uh, but it's also, I think one that makes us all appreciate going to the lengths to make your armor fit you, to make it work with the movement of your body so that it, in no place is your body conflicting with the movement of, of the armor or vice versa. The armor is not stopping you or hindering you from moving the way that you need to move. And I, and I like Eli's story about 
how bad it can be when you have an ill-fitting helmet or ill-fitting legs or ill-fitting body armor. It's, it all ha has the same dra drastic and negative effect. Um, you know, those are some remarkable examples. Even extra weight can add to the stress on your joints. It can add to, um, you know, lack of movement or even chronic uh, issues with your, with your, your body. And, and it's not to say, and well, I'm sure we'll get into this topic in a little bit, the topic of sport armor, the idea of going super light and, you know, very little protection. I know that's a concept that, that has got some controversy with it, but um, there are ways to have good looking, good covering armor, uh, even metal armor that does not turn you into, you know, a walking trash can. Um, it's just having good design, having it made to fit you very well. These are all the, the those ultimate goals that we want to have to have our equipment working for us and not against us. Yeah, and I'll just add um, that if if your armor is hurting you, um, why am I not? Or if um, if you're getting bruises after practice or you're coming home and your back hurts, it's probably something with your gear. And that for me, that's unacceptable. Um, you should always be troubleshooting your armor. I'm still troubleshooting my armor. Um, and there's things you can do um, other than replacing your armor to make it work better. And sometimes it's as easy as putting on a wristband to keep your van brace in place. Um, but I think it's really important, especially for newer fighters, you don't know what you don't know. And if something doesn't fit right, you need to tell someone or something doesn't feel right. I don't know how many people I've run into who don't carve their swords, um, which I, I, I'm shocked. You should always carve your sword. Your, your hand is not rattan shaped. So um, yeah, so if, if it hurts, if you hurt, um, just troubleshoot it, talk to somebody. Yeah, I, I donated the second rattan sword I ever made to the, my Baronese, old Baronese archive. And it is a big round stick with a big heavy barn door handle on it. And it's amazing that I ever learned to fight it all using, using that. Um, <clears throat> and it's so different from what I, what I use now. Um, <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> the second principle is supporting each piece of armor locally. Um, that is on the part of the body that is protect it's protecting that's wearing it rather than connecting it all and hanging it from a single point i've seen people hanging all their armor from essentially from their neck and that's doesn't work well for movement it it doesn't work well for longevity in fighting we've had other uh episodes where we talked about longevity and fighting and doing that is not it's not effective and it's it's counterproductive to your longevity as well so <clears throat> a van brace should be worn and supported and fitted there it can be connected with other pieces but the main bulk of it should be supported there and that distribution of weight all over your body is one of the things that makes armor wearable because <clears throat> if you put if you've ever put all your armor in a bag and tried to lift it up, it's not as easy as it is to wear it. You've seen people before, and I know I've done it before, put on my armor to go out to the field rather than carry it out there and armor up there because it's just easier to do because it's distributed weight over the body. Um, and the third principle is that your armor is just what um, Her Highness was saying. Your armor needs will change as you learn, progress, and improve. <clears throat> the armor you start with, you don't know what you don't know. And the armor you start with is good for where you are when you're beginning, if, if it's adequate to your needs and not inhibiting your learning. But <clears throat> I, I, I always tell 
students that when they reach a point in the, their learning of fighting where their armor is inhibiting what they can do, that's a good sign. It means they progressed beyond the limitations of their armor. Now they need to change their armor. And yeah, it's kind of a drag to have to change or fix or adjust your armor, but it's also a sign that you're improving. I think of it in the way of, say, a student grade instrument that a student starts with when, when they're learning, but if they continue playing, they get to a better quality instrument, a better one, and so on. You don't start a student um, on a Stradivarius, you know, um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> although I suppose even a, a, a virtuoso could play a student level instrument better than a student would, but they would be limited by the quality of the equipment. So your armor needs will change as you grow. Armor is not a one and done thing. It takes maintenance, it takes checking, it takes adjusting, it takes improving over time. And a, a piece at a time and so on is a good way to do it. So comments, anybody? Oh, you know, we have a, a comment online, but uh, it was kind of referring to what we what Misty brought up, which was uh, uh, someone said they were told they were weird because they made their grips so, uh, sword shaped. Uh, and that's so they can always know where their edge was. And this is one of those things where it's it, absolutely true. If you look at actual mm -hmm. swords, they have an oval cross section so you can feel where the edge is in your hand. And they, and they all do that. Uh, and there's a reason. Um, so yeah, it's how your equipment is configured and it gets down to some pretty small details. Um, it may not look at right away, but I think to, to Eli's point about how you advance, um, you know, in, in your experience with wearing your armor, and this is with all of your gear, swords, shields, you name it, you, you start to see more and feel more. Your perception expands so that you can understand or you can start to feel when something isn't quite right. And be patient, it takes some time to get there. There's no way that you can rush uh, into having that level of tactile feel. Um, initially it will be with how your body moves. And, and I think we're, we're going to cover this in a bit here. We're going to talk about specific parts of, of the armor, but oftentimes leg armor can, can be a limiting factor in how you're able to move. And that's one of the first things that, that I think newer fighters or, or when you get your, your own armor or putting together your first suit of armor, uh, it pays to look at. Uh, because how you move around on the field is, is going to be huge, even if it's just walking from your camp out to the battlefield for, you know, let's say you're at Penzik or, or Australia or something, you got to walk a quarter mile. Um, if you have ill-fitting armor, that's going to seem like a really long walk and your knees and legs might not be very happy when they, when it comes time to, mm -hmm. to actually fight. Um, if your, if your leg harness are slapping up against your knees and, and uh, they're not comfortable. Yeah, I, I would just add that I think um, we've all made the mistake of uh, falling in love with how a piece of armor looks um, or, oh, yeah. or you know, a good deal or whatever. And especially now when it's so easy to um, buy things online that look great, um, you can drop a whole bunch of money on something that really just doesn't work for you. Um, so I, with, with regard to that, I think it's really important to troubleshoot first um, with stuff that's, that's cheaper. And if you find that, you know, Brigadine or something works for you, then you can go get the fancy stuff later. Um, and, and then you'll know how to make it work for you better if it comes and it's not exactly right. So um, just that's a precautionary <laughs> tale about not dropping a thousand bucks. In, uh, and in and we all learn the hard way. And, and most of the armor that I've worn throughout my, <coughs> my time in the SCA, I've made myself. Uh, but whether you put in the hours and the time making it, it's still a big investment. And you find out once you've made it like, okay, that was a big mistake. Um, I think my biggest one in thinking back was I liked the look of fully articulated arm harness. Um, I just loved the way, you know, it looked like armor. Uh, but as I would, you know, for my build, as I would fight, they got heavy and they got heavy fast. Um, and as I, as I recall, I think I only made them out of 18 gauge. So they, it's not like they were, heavy duty. Uh, it's not like 14 gauge stainless or anything like that, but they were heavy enough. 
that they started to wear on my shoulders. And, and that was a big learning lesson. Like, oh, I love the way they look, but got to do something different. Yeah, I had, I think we all have pieces of armor that we've tried and worn and, and put aside that just weren't working. Oh, I yeah. had an arm harness that made me think of the Roadrunner cartoons where the, the uh, coyote would run off a cliff and then would realize he's off the cliff and gravity would catch up and it would drop. <laughs> and I had an arm harness where I'd move my arm and the, the arm harness would then catch up because it was so ill-fitting and, and that was a real impediment. So um, part of the process here is that I recommend is a systematic review from the ground up. Now you can, if you, you can also in, in the middle of fighting as you're doing something, if you find that there's something you're trying to do and you're limited, you can try removing pieces, not to spar in, but to move in. And it helps to have somebody checking this and see how you're moving if, the, if it's, and a lot of times it's the interaction of pieces. So for a systematic review, I recommend an additive system where you're, you're starting with your feet and you're adding pieces and seeing how they individually fit and then also how they interact with each other. But if you're sparring, if you're at practice, if you, and something doesn't feel right, have somebody help you and say, well, let's take off the shoulder piece and see how it works. Well, let's take off this, let's see how it works. Can you move, can you do things? And that can be a way of identifying where the interaction problems are or the individual fit problems are in that situation. But if you're gonna do a systematic review, it's good to start just with your arming clothes on and start at, at the feet, checking each individual piece for fit, making sure it's comfortable, there are no hot spots, there's no danger of self-injury, it'll stay in place, that the weight is will work. And then also check how each piece interacts with every with other pieces. Um, now, I didn't really mean, I just glossed over arming clothes, and there's a lot of, there are a lot of differences in what people wear for arming clothes. And you've got everything from people who are dressed in in linen from the skin out as period as possible. And you've got people who are using moisture wicking clothes and, and other things. <clears throat> the the pur purpose of the arming clothes is to ultimately provide uh, good movement that doesn't inhibit you and anchoring points for some of the pieces of armor. So you can anchor the pieces of armor locally, as we talked about, attach them in ways, and they'll be supported by the arming clothes. So one example of that is I've seen people with gambesons that are very open around the neck and they'll attach arm harness and the arm harness won't stay in place because it's doing this. Whereas you want a fit in a gambeson if you're going to anchor arms and shoulders to it, um, you want it, it to stay without being constricting on your neck, but being fitting, well-fitting and uh, well-structured so it doesn't shift because it's an anchor point. And the same is true with, with anchor points for your leg armor and so on, which we'll, we'll get to. So before we get into the from the feet up uh, talk, is there any, are there any other comments? Yeah, I can, I can add one on there. And this was uh, a lesson that I learned a long time ago. I'm from uh, Northern United States in Minnesota and I moved down to Texas. And of course up here, we, weather's usually pretty cool except for in the middle of summer. So I had a thick gamazon, long sleeves. Um, I mean, it looked great. And then I went down to Texas and, and I went to a practice there and everybody's got basically t-shirts on and they, you know, basically put like a kidney belt on over it. And they looked at my thick gamazon, which was made from a moving blanket. Uh, and they were just all shaking their head like, what, what are you wearing? 
you know, of course it was what, you know, 110 degrees down there. Um, fighting your armor isn't just the motion. It's also, is, can it breathe enough? Can it allow the heat to disperse? I've seen many people at, at Penzix and at hot events like Lily's uh, just overheat because their body can't breathe. And one of those things, uh, which is everything is an advantage and a disadvantage, like what Eli described with the, the closer the neck and sometimes they had a collar on it, like my Gambazon had a collar so I could just put my Gambazon or my, uh, my gorget right over the Gambazon and it would, the padding was already built in. But when it came time to release the heat, I had to take the whole Gambazon off to get air around my neck so that I could start to cool down. Um, so some of these considerations could also be regional and based on the type of weather that you're fighting in. And you can create some real problems with overheating. So make sure that, that the, what you design will hold up for where you're going to be doing a lot of your fighting. Um, yeah. Let's, let's put a pin. We do have a question, but let's put a pin in it uh, and, and come into it when we talk about it, which is uh, opinions on sports gear, such as Under Armour five pads and the like. Um, we will get to that in, in a bit here, I think, as we start talking about uh, spe specific armor. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yep. Uh, okay. I just wanted to add with the soft kit, um, a mistake a lot of people make when they first start is trying to get the most durable fabric possible. And people go with like polyester duck cloth. Oh. Um, and that stuff doesn't breathe. Um, and it honestly doesn't hold up much better than a thick linen and the thick linen is going to breathe for you. Um, so when, when you go to the fabric store, don't be afraid to spend a little bit of extra money for a natural fiber that is going to breathe because your linen going to, is wonderful. Yeah. You're going to be so much happier on the field. Um, if you, if you have something that breathes and, you know, eventually, um, I've gotten to the point where I, some of my nicest, um, garb is my, my fighting kit because I'm in it so much mm -hmm. that I think it's worth the time and the extra effort um, to have a nice linen thing that looks good. Um, and you can do so much with your soft kit to, to hide other things that are more functional, um, especially with a good surcoat. Um, so yeah, don't, <laughs> don't underestimate natural fibers. Yeah. My arming coat is um, a hemp twill. And it not only breathes as well as any linen I've worn, but it is much more durable. Um, so it's a heavyweight hemp twill that is great stuff and takes dye really well too. So um, yes, I think that's a really good point about, about regional, regional, regional considerations um, <clears throat> because the, Yet the moving blankets, so, so many people who are starting out are directed to moving blankets and they're terrible. They don't breathe at all. There's oh. a lot of artificial fibers in there. Really, really um, bad uh, stuff. Natural fibers, bamboo fill is way better than um, poly. Don't use polyester fill. If you're making your own padded gambeson or arm coat, don't use polyester fill um you can use cotton but it tends to shift the cotton mat rather than the loose cotton fluff it tends to stay better particularly if you quilt it that that also comes in a bamboo or bamboo cotton mix that's really good it breathes breathes really well um the other lesson i got from the uh the thick gambazon approach regardless of the fabric was it worked great for fighting for one day like an afternoon tournament or something like that. You go to a war where you're fighting successive days and that's your only garment. It won't dry out by the next day. Uh, yep. It just won't. It's going to be like a, a wet rug and there's very little ways to clean it. Uh, and it will be cold and clammy when you put it on the next morning and for every day. So either have, if you're going to go that route, which having done it, I would say, I would also not recommend it. And it's not so much a, what, what you make it out of, it's the fact that, that it's just got so many things going against it. Um, and what I came to was similar to what Rifkin describes or what Eli, which is just a, a cotton uh, coterie or, or essentially a long jacket. And that's, that was the base for my shoulder armor. So I would attach it to that. Um, 
I had, it was easy to have, you know, two or three of them and I could just rotate through them. But if I needed to, if it was soap, I could hang it out on a, on a line and it would dry and the next day be ready to go. So yeah, I and not, I, yeah. I've gone to having that plus uh, an, a coat that fits over that. So one of the, uh, what people often call a banana sleeve, 14th century coat that fits over most of my armor. I can also wear some over, wear armor over it um, so that uh, that can be changed in different situations. The coat can be heraldic. It can be in different, and I have several of them that I've worn in different situations depending on the the war or the people I'm fighting with or 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 so on that can be a really useful way of doing it too but the garments underneath still need to be able to anchor the what you're wearing uh, the armor you're wearing so yeah I just want to add one other thing from a woman's perspective is um, especially when you're new um, people especially if you're a smaller woman or a smaller fighter in general um, or non-binary um, people tend to over armor you because they want to protect you. And if you're wearing a huge thick gambeson and you can't move, you're not going to learn how to defend yourself and block well. And if you actually reduce the amount of padding you have and you can move effectively, you'll learn to block and you won't get hit as much anyway. So um, that is something that that happens I know to a lot of smaller fighters um, when they first come out. So um, don't don't fall into that trap. I think that's a really good point. It also depends on, on people being in a situation where they're learning, the, there's actually learning. Instead of how I learned from my first lessons in fighting, which were put me in armor and hit me until I figured out how not to get hit. And we've talked about that in some of our other other uh, episodes and and said, don't that's not a good way to to teach. Do do something different now to actually have a structured learning. And if you have a structured learning and your teachers, your coaches, your trainers are taking you as a, a new student, new fighter through the process of learning, learning things, they're not just putting you out there. And sending you out against somebody who's who's just going to hit you, um, that that works well with not over armoring somebody because you'll still be safe. So, um, okay, so <clears throat> um, we can go through the systematic evaluation and talk about materials on the way or we can talk about materials now um let's talk about some of the go on, on your original um outline and we'll go through the locations and then we'll talk about materials okay that sounds good so if i mentioned that if somebody's having a limitation they can't do something in the middle of training i'll i'll do a process of elimination removing pieces until they're able to do it and then We've identified the problem with pieces or interaction with pieces of armor. But if I'm doing a systematic evaluation, I'll do it from the feet up. And we talked about your arming clothes and how, how that is. So I start the same way I start in teaching someone about fighting. I start with the feet. And it's the same thing I do when starting with evaluating somebody's armor fit, starting with their feet. So um, what are you wearing on your feet? Is it period footwear? Is it modern footwear? Is it, is, is it, have, is it good foot support? Do you slip? I've seen and I've worn period shoes where my feet weren't stable. They would slide off it. There wasn't enough support on the feet. Um, I've seen period footwear that works very well. Do you have, is the bottom... <clears throat> the the feet footwear also has to fit the situation. If you're <clears throat> fighting outside, a leather sole can work great. If you are fighting inside on concrete or linoleum, you may slip and slide all over the place, particularly if you're still learning balance. 
So what are you wearing on your feet? Is your, are your feet armored or, <clears throat> or not? There are different kinds of foot armor that have to be supported by the footwear you're wearing. <clears throat> um, are you wearing them or not? If you're wearing big, heavy, clunky, steel-toed boots, <clears throat> your toes will be safe, but your footwork will be inhibited by simply the weight and lack of flexibility of the of the footwear. So that's feet. Um, yeah, I think comments? footwear is one of the one of the areas that people are most guilty of uh, choosing footwear based on what it looks like and not based on good yeah. ankle support, good arch support, and the ability to move uh, without the pos without the danger, the risk of rolling your ankle, or at least having your feet being able to move around. Um, I was guilty of the engineer boots for a long time as well yeah. back in the day. Um, so it's, you know, you learn the hard way. I will say when I do wear period footwear for fighting, I also wear um, neoprene ankle sleeves. So that gives me the ankle support that I won't have necessarily in the period footwear. So <clears throat> you can, you can do a combination of elements that will get you that. <clears throat> that being said, I am not a fan of uh, glaringly modern footwear. It's easy enough to make a leather booty to cover your modern footwear. I'm really not a fan of cleats. I've seen cleats on the field and um, those are, uh, you know, uh, unless you're planning on being Ty Cobb and intentionally um, going cleat first into somebody, I, which would be dishonorable. And Ty Cobb was a skilled baseball player, but he was a bastard too. So um, <clears throat> don't, I don't, I don't, I find those are gla glaringly modern. And, and even if your armor is not perfectly period, you should strive to avoid things that are glaringly modern. <clears throat> and that can be achieved by covering up things. Um, so we do have for, a question uh, from a listener. It says, uh, do you prefer a sole with rubber, a shoe with a rubber sole for a grip or leather sole for authenticity? I, I prefer rubber. Um, I, I'll buy period shoes and they'll have a Vibram sole. Um, I, I do a lot of fighting on concrete and that's <laughs> what works for me. But I also wanted to say a lot of people um, sh suffer from shin splints and plantar fasciitis in the SDA. And those are not normal things. People <laughs> go, go to the podiatrist and um, figure out what's going on with your feet and get insoles that work for you and your plantar fasciitis will go away. Um, buying sh like period shoes from Bohemond or somebody else off the rack works so much better when you have your insole in it. Um, yeah. And, and if you're going to go the period shoe route, um, just because one pair is too thin or doesn't work for you off the, off the hook or off the rack, um, don't give up on period shoes because um, if you get some that are custom made for you or you get a version that's made wider, um, they are really comfortable. So I, I just, I, I had that problem too. And I, then you find a, a pair that work for you and you find, you know, the insole that works for you. And um, all of a sudden it's, you know, just like wearing your tennis shoes. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I have custom orthotic insoles that I wear with everything, um, which are, are, you know, if we've talked a lot about stance and movement, well, if your orthotics will help your stance, good, good fitting insoles that are made for you will help your stance, uh, help your knees, help your longevity of fighting, help your balance posture all of those things um and and those and you can put them in period shoes and if you get them for you should get them first so that whatever footwear you're wearing you can have fitted with the the insoles in in them it's a very good point thank you um so <clears throat> yeah and i also prefer some something like rib, rubber or vibram soles on my on my shoes because we're not always fighting outside i fought outside in leather and it's okay unless the grass is wet 
then it's really terrible, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to be recreating the French side in Agincourt every, every time I go out on the field. So, and foundering in the mud. Um, so <clears throat> the next thing I would say are greaves, the defenses for your lower legs. Um, <clears throat> um, uh, so many different kinds of material uh, I've seen. Um, one of the, there are a couple of places where there can be problems in the interaction. <clears throat> And the first is how they interact with your feet and with your shoes. Um, <clears throat> because a lot of times greaves have a cutout in the front for the front of your foot and then dip down to cover your ankles. If they don't, if they're just a tube, they can, can rotate. And if they're demi-greaves, half greaves, they'll, and spin around, pretty soon they're cutting you or they're not covering what they need to cover. And that can be a bit of a problem. Um, <clears throat> there was a time when I used um, shot soccer shin guards, which just pull on, and I used those inside taller boots. And that worked well. <clears throat> there are lots of different ways to solve this. One of the great things about the SCA is its breadth. And the fact that you can be from any of the centuries that we talk about from any culture in the world, and they all have armor and they're different ways to um, make things, provide the protection and the functionality and the appearance. And if you're interested in a particular culture, if you, your persona or your area of interest in a particular culture, talk to people who do that. Because there, there are people who say, hey, you know, I do it this way and here's how I cover things and here's what I have and here's what I do, but talk to them. Don't just imitate what they're doing without understanding what they're doing. And that's something we've also talked about in the skills of fighting is imitation without understanding can cause you to learn bad habits. And when you're imitating the solutions that somebody has developed for their armor within a particular culture and period without understanding the details of it, that can be, you can just cause problems for yourself. Um, greaves also <clears throat> have to interact with the knees and knees are required. Greaves aren't required armor. I strongly recommend them because if you've ever uh, blocked something and had it skip down and hit your shins and you weren't wearing anything um, on your knees, that uh, hurts. Uh, and can, can actually keep you out for a while. Um, <clears throat> how it interacts with the knees though, if <clears throat> uh, I, I, anybody who's been fighting for any length of time has probably gotten their kneecaps caught inside their greaves at some point. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> um, to where people are on the sidelines are saying oil can like they're uh, the Tin Man in The Wizard of Oz you know, because you got to un unhook things. Um, so you have to watch how those pieces interact. Are they going to, when you, with the knees, when you bend your knee, are you still covered? Or is there an opening? Uh, can you kneel in it? Because that is something we still do. Can you kneel in it and get up again? <clears throat> how does that work? Um, <clears throat> knees are made knees, cuisses, all of the armor are made from lots of different kinds of material. The, the requirement is a hard over soft, but unspecified it has to be an equivalent of certain hard material with a certain level of, of padding uh, under it. Um, Can I jump in with a comment on the greaves before we get on? To yeah, material? please, please do. Yeah. Um, one thing I found was tremendously helpful was seeing and feeling for myself how much going to the ground and kneeling repeatedly wound up impacting the very top of my shin right at the bottom of the knee. And so putting extra padding in under and uh, under that part of your armor is basically like having built in knee pads so that you can drop to the ground safely. And that's the one thing about about bruising, you can have a gentle kind of a bump to one area once or twice or three or four or five times, but 
the more you do it, even though it's a soft impact, you will create, you can create even deep bruising by repeated impact. So do yourself a favor and add a little bit of extra padding where you would drop to your knees and it will really save your knees over the long run. I, I have to echo that. Um, I actually have a bone spur that I developed from dropping to my knees that um, the doctor was like shocked about because it's almost like I have another kneecap under my kneecap um, that was giving me nerve damage. Um, so I, protecting that part of your knee is super important. Um, I, I don't wear um, greaves, at least I don't wear real greaves. I've, I've gone to like fake greaves just for aesthetic, but I wear two, two uh, knee pads under my knees for that very reason. Yeah. Uh, somebody uh, here contact uh, commented, uh, many of us in Calentir um, who use hidden armor have taken using construction knees with the built-in knee braces and they're extremely supportive and comfortable. I think that's, that is good advice. Yeah, I think that can that can work very well, depending on your knees and and also your movement. And are the braces limiting or are they supportive? And and how do they fit you? And it's all has to be very individual mm -hmm. as well. Um, I also now it 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 does remind me that some pieces of armor I pad and some pieces I don't and I wear the padding so for example I've got on my greaves I got uh, a little bit of padding in the greave right along the front um, <clears throat> right along the the place where it goes right over my shin <clears throat> but I don't pad the knees I wear knee pads and I wear knee pads that protect the front and the side of my knee <clears throat> so I can can still still move in them, um, <clears throat> and I but the creases the thigh protection I pad those in the in the armor. And again, it's an interaction of those. I know people who wear padded uh, hose and and put armor over that. And again, that that becomes an issue of um heat dissipation as well and and how you make that and that's perfectly acceptable uh, there you can get off the rack again you can get padded creases and padded uh padded soft uh arm and clothes creases and legs and 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 body and all of that uh but it all has to fit well and all has to interact with your armor as well um if we move on to creases, we also have to talk about how they hang. And, <clears throat> and that's one of the biggest issues I've seen. And what I will do <clears throat> with creases, assuming that the knee, say the kind of crease that has the knee attached, is I will pick it up and hang it, move my hand along the top until it hangs straight or in the same angle that someone's leg hangs because a lot of times you'll find people have hanging points on it and the weight of the of the the knee armor is pulling it off to the side and so when somebody wears it they won't realize it but they're constantly having to exert a little bit of force to wear the armor in the correct position and that actually causes over time some fatigue and wear and can cause hot spots. So you want to hang the creases from the point where they hang in this on, on the same line as the leg. <clears throat> well then, and, and creases again, so many different kinds of materials. Um, <clears throat> there's so many different kinds of steel. There are different kinds of plastics. There's leather. Um, I've worn variations of all of those uh, over the years. Um, some people do just a, uh, a soft um, uh, crease, soft, essentially padded uh, clothing to which they attach a, a knee cop. Um, <clears throat> that can work too. Um, that's one, one of the places when people are starting out that they tend to either under armor or over armor. Um, <clears throat> and if they under armor their leg and they're not very good at defending it, 
and they 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 may be dissuaded from returning to practice soon. Um, <clears throat> but if they over armor it, they may not be able to adequately feel what's happening to learn how to judge blows. Um, so where, how do you hang your cuisses? And <clears throat> I know people who use a, uh, have used and been recommended something like a weightlifting belt, which I don't, there are people who, who use it, who recommend it, who like it, been using it for a long time. I favor the kind of belt, it's called a C belt. It's, it's so that when you, when you, it's shaped kind of like a C and when you bring it around and, and buckle it, it makes kind of a cone. So it sits on your hips um, <clears throat> and that distributes the weight of the leg harness without shifting, I, I find very well. I know other people who use a, a poor point, a, like a, 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 a cloth vest that fits very closely, that has attachment points for the leg at the bottom, very authentic, very period, and works very well, has to fit perfectly to do that. Um, a C-belt, which can be made of leather or, or uh, heavy fabric, those should be multiple layers, like a heavy canvas, um, <clears throat> can be adjustable. Uh, whereas a, a poor point, uh, if you go up and up or down in weight uh, significantly, it doesn't fit anymore. You have to have another one. Um, <clears throat> so you can also, with a C-shaped belt, have multiple hanging points for different leg harness. If you end up having multiple kinds of leg harness for different sorts of tournaments um, for different kinds of, for war tournament, um, combat of 30 period, 14th century, you wanna to switch to a different century, you can attach, multi, you can have multiple attachment points there. Um, questions, comments? Um, yeah, I tell you, the sea belt really is magic. <laughs> It is the most wonderful platform for hanging uh, leg harnesses just flat out that I've ever tried. And I've seen and tried most everything. Uh, and they are the ones really that provide consistent success really with, I would say no failure, but only minor adjustment needed. Um, they're just fantastic. There's no, there's no equivalent. Um, any belt, and, and it was quite a while since I've seen one of these, but the, the military belts where they have the shoulder harness in them, any harness that attaches weight to your shoulders for your lower body is going to be problematic. It's going to add more weight to your shoulders. It's going to have your upper body armor plus your lower body armor added onto the shoulders. It's best to separate the weight. Let, let your waist take the weight of your lower body armor and let your, your shoulders take the weight of the upper body armor. This is the best distribution you're going to yep. get. Now, when it comes to hanging uh, leg harness, what I've found is it's better to attach the strap to the cuisses on the side of your hip, not on the front. Basically, if you hang them on the front, when you're standing up normally, your leg harness will, will be in the right spot. When you bend your hip like to, to step forward, the leg harness will slide down your leg and the knee cop will come off, want to come off of your knee. And so as you're walking, your knee harness, your leg harnesses are sliding up and down your thigh. And that's just not good. But because your hip socket is the rotation point, if you put the straps on the side, that's where your hip actually does the rotating. So your leg harness will stay in the same spot on your leg as you do your forward walk. Um, I think another... one of the other one of the other problems that it one of the other factors that causes that problem is when people starting out, they often make the creases too long, so they yeah. come up past the point of the hip socket. essentially where the hip bends. Right. And so no matter where they attach it, it's going to, mm -hmm. it's not going to move with their, their thigh because it's rotating from the long point, wrong point. So it's, I think that's a, an issue as well. Yes, that is a design issue. Um, and does, ergonomically designing armor is a skill in and of itself. Yes. Um, and it's a remarkable one and somebody can make beautiful armor, but doesn't mean that it, it's designed for use. 
Um, one of the more complicated designs that I've seen is, I think it's called a, a cross mount, where there's a strap that mounts on the front of the cuisse that goes around to the side of the hip. And then there's a, 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 a leather strap that attaches from the side of the cuisse that goes around to the front of the hip. And it crosses like this in, in each on each side. Uh, it's very strange. Um, I've not seen it perform terribly well, although it's a lot better than mounting the strap straight on the front. Um, the other, the other thing I wanted to mention, which is something I have seen fail many, many times, is when people, instead of attaching their uh, a, a leather strap, like riveting it to the belt, they put a loop on it. And it starts out on the side of their hip. And as they fight, it starts to slide forward. And then you've got your, your cuisses hanging down uh, too far down your legs, and you got to keep readjusting it. So um, I always like doing just a buckle on the... Uh, on the belt itself and then each leg harness has it has the strap so you can actually unbuckle it and remove it from the belt as opposed to having it all integrated um, those are some of the common things i've seen at least for your typical european harness i mean we could get into japanese harness and all the different kinds of, of armor but we just don't have time to, to go yeah. in too heavy to all the different varieties of of leg armor so um <clears throat> Yes, I, I, I concur with all of that. Um, and then the, I've also seen people put the, the, the belt for their leg harness over their gambeson. And then when they try to raise their arms, they can't because the belt is holding it down. So it should be under the, the gambeson or padded coat or whatever you're wearing to for your for your upper upper body armor and i concur with what you said about not attaching it to your shoulders when i started out my i attached my arm harness to my directly in my coat of plates not to the clothing i was wearing and i made a, a visby style coat of plates from scrounged material which included 16 gauge steel plates that were overlapping by an inch. So this thing was really heavy. And every time I moved my arm, because it was attached to the body, it was, I was also trying to lift the entire weight of my body armor as well. So again, that principle of distribu distribution of the parts of armor. I think um, that what you mentioned about the weight, maybe this is a good time to talk about the materials, because sure. I think there's, there's a, a wide variety, especially when it comes to, to thigh armor and body armor in particular, people have a wide variety of choices of what kind of materials they're going to use. And uh, the, the typical mindset uh, thinking is that metal is much heavier than plastic or leather. So avoid the metal and go with leather and plastic. Uh, and that can be true, especially in cases like what you mentioned, where, uh, you know, the material was a little heavier than it needed to be for overlapping plates. Um, and I'm sure that was, you know, before we had such, uh, such great access to uh, aluminum, like uh, heavy duty aluminum, but thin, lightweight lamellar plates. Yeah, it was make. 16 gauge mild steel. So yeah. it, was, it was heavy. Yep. Yep. It wasn't. And, uh, uh, yeah, some of the materials similar, now. I think, yep. with, uh, with a, a 16 gauge stainless, uh, we got these little plates and, and somebody made a full coat of plates out of them. And <laughs> I think it weighed like 80 pounds. It was mm -hmm. crazy. Um, but when it comes to it, if you choose the right uh, material, whether it's a, a stainless that's a little harder than mild steel, so it's a little bit more dent resistant, or you've got like a T6 aluminum or a high, high tensile strength aluminum for lamellar, you have some options that are not that much heavier than, than plastic uh, or leather even. Leather, it seems like it's light, but when it's thick enough to provide solid protection, it's actually heavier than you think it is, especially when it starts to get wet. When you start getting armor soaked with water and sweat, it starts adding on weight uh, pretty quickly. Uh, and then like with lamellar, you also got to, got to deal with the weight of the rivets, which leathers is the rivets holding leather are not gonna be any lighter than the rivets holding steel plate or metal right. plates on. Um, so that's and a consideration too. There's also now that there wasn't, it's, it's really only in the past um, decade, maybe, 20 years that that spring steel and uh heat treated heel steel that is thin and durable 
is more available um titanium as well quality armors yep so <clears throat> there's so many different kinds of materials including plastics that are are light but still have to be the right kind of plastic that aren't brittle um <clears throat> and the, so or too soft or too soft that don't really do anything and um <clears throat> don't use uh, i'll uh, i was fighting someone once and i i hit my opponent in the leg and heard this horrible cracking sound and i thought oh my god i've broken his femur and it turned out he had used strips of plywood as leg armor and I he said, oh, oh, it's OK. It's it's I use ply. So what plywood as, as these splinters were coming out and we had a discussion about the inadvisability of using plywood pieces for armor. Um, so not every material uh, is a, is a good choice. You know, and to mention, I think the the commenter wanted to know something about the. Uh, I think they're called Zumbang. The it's a modern, <clears throat> softer uh, type material that that hardens. It's got some kind of a behavior where if you hit it, it's it solidifies for a moment. It's got sort of a strange physical quality. Non Newtonian to it that, fluid. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, now I've never tried it or used it myself, but I know that that quite a few others have and have really liked it. Uh, do either of you two have any experience with it? I've tried it. Um, I think the the pads themselves work pretty well. Um, I find that um, they're always put on a compression shirt unless you buy the pad separately. And the compression shirts for me are way, way, way too tight. And the pad doesn't move with the compression shirt. And it makes me claustrophobic. So I do not, um, I do not recommend the shirts um, if you have any sort of claustrophobic tendencies at all and i haven't worn it i've known people who tried it and gave it up because it, they thought it was too hot didn't dissipate heat i know other people who wow. like it i just have have not i've thought about it but haven't really seen the need to to try it i haven't seen an advantage in it over what i'm i'm um, doing now I, I do like the hex pads. Um, I I love their stuff. It, they move well. They articulate well on your body. Um, but I find that under my lamellar, I actually don't need any padding. I just wear a linen tunic. Good. All right, let's go to the, we're talking about body armor. Yes. Um, so I think this is one that has some of the most variability for different ways of protecting your body that that provides different levels of flexibility um very different levels of wearability like where the weight is sits and it's also the easiest to hide with things like tuna tunics and surcoats and and uh things like that that you can basically hide your body body armor if you're thinking of your task list of putting together like how am i going to build my armor the body armor is probably the easiest one to do of all of them yeah and uh, i i wear a what's generally referred to as a Corazina, which is an Italian style 14th century body armor that you can put on and, and um, uh, buckle in the front. And I can wear that either under my arming coat or over my arming coat, depending on the day and the temperature and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> one important thing I've found <coughs> with body armor <clears throat> is that body armor often tends to be heavier in the front of the body. And if somebody is wearing that, that will exert a forward pressure on their posture and can result in their back hurting. And so what I recommend, and I learned this with a Visby coat of plates, is because a Visby coat of plates, that T-shaped thing you put your head through and then body armor and it wraps around your body is there's a back flap and I added a strap to the back flap to buckle around to my front underneath the front armor which then buckles in the back 
and that distributes the weight more evenly on the body. Even with the Corazino, which is fairly light, um, I have uh, ties from the back plate that I bring around to the front just to make sure that the weight is balanced between the front of my body and the back of my body so that it's not exerting any kind of uh, force in an undue way. And so one of the things that I do when looking at somebody's body armor, well, where does it hang from? Are there shoulder straps? Let's hang it by that and see, is it pulling in one direction or the other? And then how can we adjust that so it sits in a balanced way on the body? Um, <clears throat> there's so many different kinds of body armor, uh, so many different materials. And <clears throat> I think that, you know, certainly kidneys are required to be covered. And a lot of people don't understand where the kidneys actually are, which is just in, inside the lower, ri um, lower ribs in the back of the body. Um, <clears throat> but I think it's also important to cover, and this is personal opinion, to cover um, the sternum and xiphoid process and something that will cover your collarbones, but that can also be from the um, camel of a, a helmet, cover your collarbones. Um, because those, that's, those are areas that can be damaged and can have significant repercussions if they're damaged. Um, and the only, th the only thing worse to recover from a break from than a collarbone is a tailbone because oh. neither you can, you can't set either one. You can't put a cast on it. You just have to basically sit there and suffer in pain until it heals. <laughs> and, and everybody I've heard that's had problems with either one has said that this is a world of suck. So you yep. want to avoid that. And I've known people who've had collarbone surgery to, to reattach and replay and yep. align the collarbone. It's yeah. If the break is bad enough, then a surgery is called is in order. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now <clears throat> another point about the body armor. And again, there are so many styles we couldn't possibly cover them all, but <clears throat> I've seen people with, body armor where the straps are very wide and you have to keep in mind the rotation of the arm and where the arm rotates and so if the strap is too wide for your body armor it's going to inhibit your your arm movement so i recommend that the and also if it sits too far out so i recommend uh that the straps for your body armor sit close to your neck, not pulling on it, not impinging on, on it, because that would be uncomfortable, but here, and um, so that your eye won't inhibit your arms. I also, I use a, a gorget, and the gorget sits under the body armor, so that the body armor holds it in place, because <clears throat> whereas hard over soft is a, a important way to approach a lot of armor <clears throat> you want no contact you don't want hard over soft is the hard distributes the force and then the soft uh, cushions it you don't want to any contact with the front of your throat because it doesn't take very much so my gorget sits there's padding in there to protect from from my me against the abrasion of the gorget and in case of incidental contact, but the gorget sits away from my throat, move it, away from my throat, realize I was blocking myself with the microphone, away from my throat. And then the body armor sits over the plate, the, the, um, the, the yoke of the gorget to hold it in place, to hold it down. I've also seen a lot of gorgets of that style sold where the sides of it are very wide. And the problem with that, again, is it impinges on your arm movement. And so if you've got a gorget with uh, a, a yoke and it's got a wide plate on the side and you've got wide straps for your a body armor and you've got then a shoulder protection on top of that, and, and an arm harness, 
the, you're fighting four layers of armor to just to try to move your arm. And so that's that's one of those key areas of interaction um, where you have to understand the interaction of the pieces where that can be that can be an issue. Um, <clears throat> The, the old style dog collar gorget that was just a piece of leather with some foam under it, I used that for a long time. It's, it's not very functional because it relies on, it relied on padding uh, of the throat rather than keeping it contact away from the throat. I also have a, a camel off my helmet, which is another layer of inhibition of contact against the throat. Um, <clears throat> uh, comments? Uh, one thing about the, the padded dog collar, it also adds to the heat level. Uh, the neck and the, the lower part of your skull, <clears throat> especially in the back, is some of the, the best place for your body to get cooling because the blood comes right close to the skin. And if that's hot, it's like wearing a, hot, like wearing a scarf in, in summer weather. Um, I found very similarly, it's, it's best to have a gorget that sits away from the neck a little bit, just to allow some airflow through there. It will be, it's a night and day difference in terms of comfort level when you're fighting in, in hot and humid weather. Um, it may feel comfortable to have that padding up against your neck, like you feel secure with it, but boy, uh, the trade-off for heat is just not worth it, uh, in my opinion. Um, and I've seen too many people suffer from heat problems, you know, when they go to a, a hot event and and uh, they're just, they're struggling. Um, usually the first thing is take the gorget off and get a cool rag or something and put it along their neck because they're just, they're just go overheating. Um, but everything you said on is on point about the amount of plates between the shoulder and the neck. And that can, once you want to raise, try to bring your shoulder up, if that starts to pinch in. Uh, another thing is how it interacts with the helmet. And I think we'll get to that here probably next if we yeah i either that or we can cover arm arm harness next or well or, i either either way because and since you brought up helmet i think that's really significant too and i told the story at the beginning mm -hmm. about how the helmet fits and the helmet has to fit so you can you can see but it also ha you have to consider how your helmet will interact with your gorget with any kind of arming cap, whether it's padded or unpadded, with any kind of padding in the helmet, with whatever suspension you use, um, chin strap you use for your helmet. I use a four point uh, strap. Um, so there are two anchor points here and two anchor points here. And one of them comes loose so I can, so this, it keeps it from coming off this way or rotating this way or rotating this way. Um, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I've seen helmets that somebody would bend over and there'd be a gap too big because it was sitting too high on their head. And then they, they took out padding and then it sat too low and their eyes were covered. So it didn't quite, it didn't really fit. And <clears throat> others where the, the gorget was so high that it was if they their head moved to the side it would move this again it would act like a, a fulcrum and that would not be good either <clears throat> i think the worst i saw um was a, a, a penzik once a breastplate that had a piece that came up in the back a metal breastplate with a piece to come up in the back to protect the back of the neck but i showed the person with the armor and the other inspecting marshals that if they moved their head and got pushed from behind that spike would go up inside their helmet right to the base of their skull so and it, they weren't considering the interactions there um there's so many good helmets out there and there's and this is a case where exactly as um you mentioned Rukin, you mentioned that you can see a lot of great looking armor online and buy it and it won't fit. And helmets, <clears throat> really well-made helmets, really well-made good looking helmets, really well-made good looking period helmets can be very, very expensive. <clears throat> and it's, if you, 
the best armorers want you to take very precise and very specific measurements so that it can be fit to you. But you have to consider also how you're padding it, how you're um, attaching it, and the other pieces you're wearing with it. You know, and we can also talk about materials here too, because up until about 15 years ago, all helmets pretty much were either mild or, or stainless, but now we're getting into, we've gotten into spring steel, um, different, and there aren't many, I mean, you're not seeing helmets out of aluminum or anything like that, but with spring steel, you can have the equivalent thickness and have it be much lighter. And I've got to help my sleigh is like that too. In fact, it's almost dangerously light because part of what protects your head is the mass of the helmet not being able to accelerate quickly when somebody hits it. And con concussion injuries are from your brain bouncing off the skull. So if your head accelerates quickly, that's not really the helmet's fault or the, necessarily the padding's fault. It's if the helmet's too light, it can actually be a problem for protection. Likewise, going to a helmet that you don't ever want to pound a dent out of, and you go to something like a 12 gauge stainless, now that helm could be so heavy that it gives you neck problems, which can give you headache problems and all kinds of different physical issues. Um, if you want to take it off after wearing it for 10 minutes because you've got a splitting headache, you're not going to enjoy fighting. Right. Um, and so I, I would say that as you shop around for, for helmets and you're ready to spend some good money on them, uh, get familiar with what you like to have and how you like to, the type of helmet that you want to have and be, be wary of the weight, uh, try different ones, try even fighting in different ones for a, a whole day if you can borrow them, um, because you'll find out a lot about what you like and what you don't. And granted, a, a nice helmet like that has got a pretty good resale value. So if you do buy one, you don't really, doesn't work for you. Selling it is usually pretty easy and you're gonna, you're not gonna take a, a total bath on it if you, if you wanna sell it. Um, but that said, the, the, what Eli talks about in terms of the measurements is totally on point. Um, it doesn't take more than a quarter inch to a half inch to make a, a helmet not fit. Um, and so it's very important that it, that it fits you well. Um, one of the big ones that the aspects to helmets that I want to throw in, and I used to wear one of these for quite a bit, was a, a, a chain um, drape, and I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, Aventail. Aventail, yep. And the part that did not work for me was when I would run and that thing would be Fly, flying around. If I just walked around a battlefield, that thing would never be an issue. But I also felt that the weight hanging on the bottom of the helm made it kind of shift depending on my body movement. Um, and it wasn't quite for me. Of course, this was before I didn't have one of these really cool uh, welded stainless uh, oven tails that, that I think Newt makes yep, Master um, Newt. that are lighter weight. Um, but it's still something that can kind of, as, as you turn quickly, it can kind of flop around. And that was just not quite, uh, I, I outgrew it. Uh, it took me a few years, but because I love the look of it. Um, but it just, I was so active and, and doing a lot of moving on the field that it just couldn't keep up. And so I went to a, a helmet that was just a gorget with a helmet with, with a bottom on it. Um, so worked a lot better. A couple of things. And one is that in the helmet fitting, a lot of people don't make don't uh, account for the necessary amount of padding to really protect their head. Some people, uh, it's padding is the last thing they're thinking about. And there's so many different kinds of really adequate, really better than adequate ballistic padding that you can buy that and you can combine multiple layers of different kinds of padding there's also the sewn in um period helmet liners i've heard there's, great things about the period liner yeah and i as have i and i i think that people need to account for is essentially you should pad your head and then take the measurements of for the helmet don't take the measurements for the helmet and then just guess the amount of padding Get the padding right, and then measure your helm head for the the helmet. The other thing <clears throat> is, yeah, I have a, a male 
drape and it is a welded stainless master newt mm -hmm. um welded male um uh, avantail <clears throat> but <clears throat> it was getting hung up on on the buckles of my body armor uh and on the camel and and other things so the arming cap i added an arming cap that's really just two layers of the of the same hemp uh twill <clears throat> but it it sits out so that the it the camel the aventail slides on that so it doesn't it doesn't shift it doesn't catch on things so again it's how can you address the negative interaction of pieces of of armor so oh, I, I just want to jump in. Um, I can't say enough good things about the ballistic military padding. Um, Oregon Arrow does a really, really great kit. Um, I usually buy two and two is enough. Um, the really cool thing about military ballistic padding is, you know, not only is it made to, to be anti-concussion, but the pads are um, very easily moved around in your helmet so that you can find the right balance and the the right points on your head to have your helmet sit because there's nothing worse than having your helmet sit right here and give you a oh, headache yeah. and if that's happening i mean all you have to do with these things is they have velcro on them and they're like little um, stickers that you can put in your helmet and then the the pads velcro in and you can take them out and wash them which is uh, a nice feature um but those those things I literally have really changed the way that um, I see my helmet. I mean, it, it, I can pad my helmet now in five minutes where it used to take a whole afternoon. Um, I just I cannot say enough good things about those. I mean, I have a friend who wears like a rugby helmet, um, like it's a padded thing underneath his helmet. I think that has the same sort of properties. Um, but if you're not if you haven't tried that stuff, um, I really recommend giving it a shot. Cool. So um, arms. <clears throat> um, some people don't use upper arm harness. They'll just have elbows. Maybe they'll have some van braces. Um, <clears throat> I think van braces are, elbows are required. I think van braces are a very good idea because I've known people who've gotten broken arms before by, well, not only not having any armor there, but also trying to block with their arms. Um, <clears throat> and um, again, so many different kinds of materials, the same principles that apply uh, to leg, leg armor um, apply. Um, the arms can be one single piece, but they can also be multiple pieces um, with either articulated or strapped elbows in between. I know people who um, just have padding and wear just a buckled on elbow by itself, but I also see them often adjusting that because it's slipping. Uh, those, an elbow can be pointed as, as in tied to uh, a garment that's underneath. Um, the arms, if you're wearing full arms or you're wearing some kind of rare brace they can be pointed to the arming garment the arming clothes that's underneath um keeping in mind the same idea as um we talked about with the uh, creases if it's too long and you move your arm it's going to shift everything out of position you have to understand where the points where the point of rotation is and try test fitting armor, start with the arming clothes, but <clears throat> you can mock up, and I did this when I was making the leather pieces of armor for attaching metal joints to, I'd mock them up out of cardboard first, corrugated cardboard for fit and see how, and I used a lot of corrugated cardboard and duct tape, to see how things would fit and if it would rotate and if it would move and and so on. Because um, if it if you attach it in the wrong point, and it can be a matter of just a, a little bit of difference, attach it in the wrong point, it won't move with you and will again inhibit what you're what you're doing. 
Um, <clears throat> keep in mind, you do want some padding around the, the hard parts of your elbow because you don't want hard surface sitting on hard surface. That's a hard over soft area. I also recommend some kind of padding, whether it's cloth or something else, foam or any kind of thing. Uh, if you're wearing a gorget, particularly on, on the bone part, the bone part where the bone is near the surface. Where bones are near the surface, you want padding. Where bones are not near the surface, most people have some natural padding. Um, <clears throat> one of the other things with arms is um, I've seen them be too long uh, so that they slide down and then they inhibit the movement of the wrist and hand. Um, <clears throat> in period ar some period arm or metal harness, it's typical to see the arming clothes from underneath come back over the van brace to keep it from sliding down, but also to protect the wearer from their own armor. So the length of everything and where it rotates and how it fits, how it interacts is important. And if you add shoulders to that, well, the shoulders have to go over the, the point and have to attach in a way. I've seen people attach shoulders to gorgets. That can work, but can also, I've seen people attach arm harness to gorgets, and that tends to want to move the gorget and exert pressure against the side of the neck in ways that can be uncomfortable, depending on the fit of the gorget <clears throat> and the fit of the arm and clothes underneath. So the arm harness can be attached to the arming clothing. Uh, the shoulders over that also attach to the arming clothing, although there is there are period ex examples of it being attached to the gorget as well. Keep in mind, though, if your body armor is strapped to fit over your gorget and now you're attaching shoulders on top of that, I recommend against attaching the shoulders to the straps of the body armor because those will tend to want to pull the straps out of place, which can cause problems in interaction with your arms. So I, I, I'm just gonna um, jump in with some sport armor recommendations. Um, if you get street hockey elbow pads, um, those are really great. Um, if you're you know, just coming in, I, I still use mine under my shield because I don't need a, a fan under my shield. Um, so there are a lot of, a lot of really good options. I um, am one of those people that doesn't wear van braces. I just wear hex pads um, and I've never had a problem. I have um, very muscular forearms, so I have that natural padding. Um, but uh, I just, there's a lot of options there that are comfortable um, and light and that um, are very entry level um, for people and very accessible. Yeah, the farther out you go away from your body, the less weight you need to add for you to still feel it as being remarkable weight. Um, and that's what I learned the hard way in van braces because they're far away from your body, especially as you throw, all of that weight is going to be out uh, near your hand or at your forearm. So it'll, it'll add up very quickly as, you, as you're, you're doing your fighting. Um, <clears throat> moving along here, because we're close to our time limit um <clears throat> let's talk about gauntlets half gauntlets basket hilts weapons shields the, all the interaction of those and that's oh that's a whole episode by by itself probably um <clears throat> i think we'll um, have to just cover gauntlets with tonight's episode yeah i think so um <clears throat> the 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 issue biggest issue i see with gauntlets is how they interact with the van braces because they sometimes will interact in ways that will cause pressure points of, of the van braces. If you don't have van braces, um, I, and I think hex pads are a, a great option there because it provides some protection. Um, <clears throat> but if there can be interactions, I can, I've also seen people buy ha half gauntlets and gauntlets without really trying them on and understanding how they will work for what they're trying to do in fighting. Gauntlets are really 
a, a, one of the most complicated pieces of armor to do well, because um, to, to move, particularly for the way that we fight, because we are not, we're, we're doing more uh, articulation with our hands uh, often in movements to direct uh, blows than in, in some styles of armored combat. Uh, <clears throat> consequently, um, gauntlets uh, are, are tough to do. Um, <clears throat> half gauntlets, um, to, I, I, a lot of people use basket hilts, and the way the half gauntlets interact with basket hilts can be a, a problem in that they can catch, they can limit movement. Uh, for a while, I used a liner inside my basket hilts. Same reason I, I have a um, arming cap that has a, um, a mantle as part of it because it it's it essentially reduces the interaction, the friction between pieces. You can do that with a liner in the basket hilts, but if it doesn't fit, if when you move your hand, there are hot spots, you feel the pressure, um, <clears throat> that will cause problems and could potentially cause injury if you're struck there. I, th I think that, and, and this is something I came, came across long ago, the most personal pieces of armor are going to be your helmet, and that usually includes your gorget and the gauntlets. Those are the two that are the hardest to replace and find things that fit you really well. Um, it's, uh, and I'm a pole arm fighter and spear fighter, so full, I use full gauntlets for everything. Uh, I know a lot of sword fighters will go to basket hilt so that they don't have to fuss about finding a full gauntlet that will uh, fit their hand and be good protection and they aren't fighting it. Where I've run across the most uh, issues with fighting against gauntlets is the cuff. If the cuff is not wide enough or, or bells out enough as you extend the wrist, it can actually hit you in the forearm. And for years I had cuffs that wouldn't, didn't feel quite right and, or fit quite right. And I had bruises on the top and bottom of my forearms from either getting hit on the cuff and having it come into my arm or, you know, actually rotating from my sword shot. I could never tell exactly which one because I was busy doing fighting at the time, but uh, it was one of those things where I had to learn. I eventually went to a, a leather cuff uh, to help, help avoid that. And it was a longer one, but it belled out enough so that it allowed me the the rotation this way that I needed, as well as a slight bit of that break without stopping the motion. If the cuff is too narrow, it will actually stop your, your, the motion of your wrist extension. Now there are some styles, and I know this is probably a whole episode in of itself, is how do you throw a blow? Do you need that, that last bit of wrist snap or not? Some schools of thought are, no, you don't need it, and it's bad, bad to do that. And other schools, yes, absolutely you do. So this is how the armor is actually going to be tuned to how you fight as well as, um, as how it, how it fits just you moving around. Um, there's a big controversy about finger gauntlets. And this is one of those things I'll just say, I've yet to see a finger gauntlet that I would trust being hit by the, an average broadsword uh, directly on the finger. <clears throat> and uh, for people that are jewelers or pianists or people that use their fingers and need them for their job, I'd say never, ever trust them to finger gauntlets, period. Uh, get a clamshell gauntlet, a Milanese gauntlet, or some, something that's got full protection over the top of the fingers, not individual. I know finger gauntlets are sexy as hell. They look great. Um, they'll, they'll wow anybody that sees them, but uh, all it takes is one good shot, and you know you got a broken finger. I'll just add to um, the cuff. I, I, I also think that that is one of the biggest issues people have, um, even on demi gauntlets. Um, a lot of times the cuff will be too long. Um, you really don't need a very long cuff. Um, and a lot of times it will bridge or impede the basket hilt um, and you won't get range of motion. And one of the ways to combat that um, is to actually rotate your um, basket hilt a little bit. Um, and cant it off center, um, which helps a ton, um, I think. So that's that's one way to do it. And I, I love my Gretter full gauntlets. They're oh. the only full gauntlets that um, I will use because I, I use my hands for a living. Um, but I, I can't make those work with a basket hilt. So um, 
uh, the cuff isn't flexible enough, my uh, I find that having a leather cuff on my demi is um, really key so that um, I don't get those kind of wrist bruises. Yeah, I have a, a pair of stainless uh, demi gauntlets for use with a basket hilt, um, <clears throat> which look, I like the look of them, but I had to open up the, the cuff and add a piece about a three inch long piece of stainless that I, I shaped to, to, so that the cuff belled out enough. Um, and, and I knew I could do that. So I have most armor that I've ever bought in, I have done some customizing too, so that it would fit. Um, Any suit needs to be tailored to, to fit yeah, perfectly. Exactly, exactly. Um, <clears throat> if you're not getting it bespoke, then you should get it tailored. And there are people who can help you do that. Um, <clears throat> I have, I do have, I have used full gauntlets over the years. I've never been entirely satisfied with them. Um, <clears throat> um, Gretters are absolutely magnificent. Um, <clears throat> I have a pair of full gauntlets, not Gretters, that I bought that I, I think will work for me, but they've been sitting on my workbench for the customization work I need to do that um, I got them just before the pandemic and they've been sitting there <laughs> and I haven't done anything with them yet, um, but intend to. And I think they'll work for, for what I need. And I, I also use my hands a lot as evidenced by uh, my studio here. Um, <clears throat> um, now we're just really at the time and we haven't talked about <clears throat> mentioned briefly basket hilts. I think the interaction, I, I agree, sometimes the interaction with them doesn't work. I've also seen basket hilts that are enormous and too big for the size of somebody's hand. Um, <clears throat> we haven't really talked about uh, weapons. We're really talking about armoring the body. Weapons and shields are, uh, are another subject, I think, for another another time. I think we've covered most of what we need to talk about. And just to reiterate the principles, safety, functionality, and appearance in that order, supporting pieces of armor locally rather than hanging everything from one point, and your armor will change as you grow and learn and improve. Um, I, goodness knows I'm not wearing the same scrounged 16 gauge overlapping plate, Visby, uh, Visby coat of plates and fully articulated carpet arms that I started with, with a monstrous helmet that was huge. I'm not using that anymore. Uh, I would hope not. Um, your armor needs will change as you improve. Uh, and that's actually, it's a pain to have to, change your armor, but it's part of the process and it's actually a good thing. Yeah, and I'll wrap up with, uh, try not to fall into the trap of thinking that you're just graduating into removing pieces of armor and that the ultimate goal is you're wearing a cup and a helmet um, and away you go. Uh, the, the best fighters will wear a suit of armor like James Bond wears a suit. It's part of them. As they move, you will see that it is integral with how they fight. Um, that's what you're striving for, not just removing pieces. Yes, you're going to trim down what you start with. You're going to find some, some uh, conflicts. You're going to find yourself running into, into pieces of armor, how it fits together. But you're really tuning it. You're tuning it to how you move. Think of it that way, not just, oh, I want to fight in a tunic and in the, you know, in a helmet. Um, make it do what you need to do and provide you the safety that you want to have. Yeah, I'll, I'll conclude just by saying that um, I think fine tuning your armor is a never ending process and evolution. True. And uh, my friend Duke Savrick um, teaches this great class called 101 things um, to get better. And part of it is just kind of making it a game. And anytime you go to a sporting goods store or something like that, you just sort of look around and see if there's things that you know, might, um, might help you like, you know, grip tape or um, a wristband. Um, 
so I, I, I think if you sort of embrace the fact that um, your armor is never going to be perfect and you're always going to be tweaking it and just sort of um, embrace the process, uh, you'll probably be happier and you'll end up with a suit that um, doesn't hurt and um, allows you to fight your best. And just like learning anything new, I, I tell you, there's a great excitement when you find a better solution than what you've got right now. And you either buy it, make it, build it, tweak it, adjust it, and it works better. I mean, it's like a night and day difference. It's kind of like putting a turbocharger on your race car. It's, it feels like you can do what you could not do before. Oh, great. Uh, excellent. Um, I think that that about covers it if you have any other questions please uh post them to um the coaches corner um ask us um it's hard to do an armor evaluation uh remotely um but we're certainly available to answer any questions you may have and uh with that i think that's it for this Let week? me look up and see what we've got coming up next oh, week. Yep. Um, let me just check our schedule here, which is massive, and I've got to scroll all the way through it. <clears throat> all right, let's see what we got here. Um, oh, yeah, next week we've got how we evaluate candidates for knighthood. Um, and I think this was a topic that you suggested, uh, Eliyahu. And it was. Um, if I remember right, you <clears throat> and Elanon and Rifkin and Duke Sean are going to all be on this one. Yeah, and um, I thought that it would be something, and I'm not, it's not about, you know, how votes take place or all that. It's about really how, the different ways that members of the chivalry look at candidates and what they think and what they, the considerations and, and the process they go through for evaluating people. I thought that would be useful for people to understand. So that's what we're talking about. It'll be a really nice um, discussion of inner kingdom anthropology as well. So. Yeah, that makes, yeah. Um, having lived in three kingdoms and visited 15, I think, uh, I can say, yeah, there are a lot of differences. Um, and I think that will be really um, illuminating. Well, see you guys next week. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Bye, everybody.